Okay. Good morning. We will get started as we are actually a few minutes late, for which I apologize. As you know, the subject this morning is Iran. It is hard to think of an issue that is more timely, more important, and more challenging at a time the world is filled with issues which are timely, important, and challenging. But still, this issue stands out. Uh, we have, a, I believe, the right panel to, to lead the discussion in this. And what we are going to do is divide this uh, panel, in a sense, into two parts. We're going to begin, begin with some analysis of the situation. And I'm going to ask each of these four individuals, who I'll introduce in a second, to basically address the question of what is going on, why, what's behind it, and so what? What, uh, what are the consequences? And once we get done with what we in the uh, think tank and academic world call the uh, description and analysis, we will then turn to the uh, what do we do about it part, the prescription. And then we will open it up to you all to uh, fill in the gaps and correct our inevitable uh, mistakes. Let me just quickly introduce our four panelists. I'll begin with the Foreign Minister, the Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, Jack Straw. <clears throat> to, between us is uh, Professor Mahmoud Sari Ogalem from the National University in Tehran, in Tehran formerly, however, of the University of Southern California. To my immediate left is uh, Senator uh, Saxby Chambliss, who's senator from the great state of Georgia on the Republican side. And last but not least is uh, Ken Pollack um, of the uh, Saban Center at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. It's interesting just to show you how integrated this panel is. I learned that Professor Sario Gollum's name in Persian and Farsi means quick pen, and Ken Pollock is the quickest pen I know. So we've got it about right. Uh, Mahmoud, let's start with you on the basic uh, analytical questions. Uh, where do you see things with Iran, with the nuclear program in particular, and why? What is the, uh, what's motivating things here? What is the thinking in uh, Tehran? Thank you, Richard. Um, for the purposes of analysis, um, I think it would be very useful if we draw a parallel and correlation between Iran and China. Both countries do have a solid historical base, and they were both, um, they have experienced intervention and humiliation in the 19th and 20th centuries. Now, revolution led both countries to a policy of regional assertiveness. Uh, the, the Chinese ultimately learned that if they want to be assertive and powerful, one, they have to accommodate the West, and two, they have to gain an economic base for their power. Revolutionary Iran has done neither. Uh, it neither concentrated on an economic buildup, nor it has abandoned its confrontational approach uh, towards the uh, West in general and the U.S. in particular. Now, the Shah's regime and the Islamic Republic of Iran, they both pursued a nuclear program. Uh, the central dilemma with the Islamic Republic of Iran is that almost no country, including Syria, who happens to be so-called the strategic ally of Iran, no country supports Iran's empowerment. And that, has, uh, that is a reflection of Iranian policies over the last 25 years. Uh, there is an alliance of forces, both regionally and internationally, uh, to keep Iran weak because of its uh, internal structure and because of its uh, foreign policy. Now, the nuclear program in Iran uh, is, not a, uh, uh, is not a source of subjective satisfaction of pride and national prestige. I think it is a source of objective, uh, source of uh, power, and, uh, and a diversification of Iran's uh, energy sources. Iran in year 2018 is going to be a country of 100 million people. Um, now, the political system in Iran, when it comes to security issues, is a fixation. 
it really does not matter whether we have a Khatami or an Ahmadinejad. Uh, the security issues, and by that I mean Iraq, Persian Gulf security, Lebanon, the Palestinian issue, the nuclear issue, the Caspian Sea uh, legal regime, uh, all of these issues are beyond the, uh, uh, the jurisdiction of the president, no matter who that person might be. It is, uh, uh, it is part of the domain of the leader himself and the military, the revolutionary guards, and the intelligence apparatus. So I, I, I think because it is a fixation, therefore it, it really reflects a central policy of the state. Now, um, I think the nuclear program in Iran today uh, uh, has two fundamental problems. One is uh, Iranian stance to, towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and the other one is uh, Iranian approach towards the West in general, and as I said, uh, towards the, uh, the United States in particular. Uh, so the central issue is really political. It's not really technical. No matter how vigorous the IAEA uh, inspections are going to be, and, uh, and no matter how objective the guarantees are going to be, I think the central issue is really political. Iranian foreign policy, Iranian foreign security policy are in contrary to the regional status quo and to the, uh, 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 are contrary to the uh, uh, interests of the West in general. And as long as those interests are uh, in opposition to one another, I think the current confrontation between Iran and the West are going to continue. So uh, a strategically assertive Iran uh, cannot uh, uh, pursue such a goal unless it comes to terms with the West. Um, and I think uh, we have uh, heard that from many Western politicians that the central issue in the nuclear program uh, is really political, not so much technical. But just so I understand, then are you saying that unless the political relations between Iran and the West fundamentally change for the better, mm -hmm that the drive towards a nuclear program, the strategic imperative, if you will, will take Iran in that direction? That's one. And second, I think um, Iranian approach towards the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, both Rafsanjani and Khatami, uh, they ambiguously supported the two-state solution. But that, um, uh, that statement never became state policy in Iran. Uh, both under Rafsanjani and Khatami presidencies. So I think those two pillars are so okay. crucial to a change of Western attitude towards the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, just two small hurdles. Thank you for getting us off to such an auspicious start here this morning. Let me turn for a second to, to Ken Pollack, who's, who's written what I think is one of the, the basic books about contemporary Iran. Ken, give us your analysis, both of what the Iranians have, where do you think they're going with it? Thank you, Richard. I think that it is clear uh, from the IAE inspections and from Iranians, Iran's own admissions that Iran is trying to acquire all aspects of the fuel cycle. Now, of course, the great unknown is exactly what Iran's intentions are in terms of weaponization. There is evidence that the Iranians are considering, probably doing some research on weaponization. But of course, no one knows if they plan right now to cross the weapons threshold. Why are they trying to acquire it? Well, I think that there are a whole variety of different reasons for that. And I think that it runs the gamut in Iran. Uh, one of the, 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 the uh, I think one of the, the most salient points about the Iranian political body is its fragmentation. Uh, R.K. Ramazani, one of the great scholars of Iran, once used the term that Iran's political system is kaleidoscopic. It is divided up into a thousand shards of glass, and every time you turn the kaleidoscope that has changed the issue, all of those shards of glass line up differently. And so I think that there are some Iranians, and I think that many Iranians have, have varying uh, combinations of this. Some Iranians want the weapons for defensive purposes, and uh, given U.S. behavior and given U.S. Uh, rhetoric in past years, it's certainly understandable. I think some Iranians want it for prestige reasons. I think some of them want it because they believe it will enable, it will allow them to pursue their preferred foreign policy, something they've had to circumscribe over the last eight or ten years because of challenges, in particular, from the United States. As I'm suggesting, though, I think that there are real divisions, though, within the Iranian political system, within the government itself. Uh, as Mahmoud pointed out, Ahmadinejad and the presidency are only one element in a very diverse political body. 
And my own read from the outside of what's going on in Iran is that there are a great many different Iranians with a great many different views. Uh, I would start by saying that I think that it's it's important to note that the nuclear program lies at the interstices of a great many divisions within the Iranian body politic. Uh, right now, Iran is anything but the Islamic paradise that the Imam promised at the turn of the revolution. Uh, Iran's economy is in desperate straits. There's a tremendous amount of corruption. The economic and uh, problems with corruption coupled with uh, social restrictions that the Iranian people still feel is oppressive, are creating a great deal of popular unrest. There are also geostrategic problems that Mahmoud alluded to. And as a result, you're seeing a debate played out sotto voce inside Tehran uh, over a whole variety of issues, economic policy, social policy, relations with the West, and the nuclear issue gets wrapped into all of that. Now, what I'd suggest is that for the Iranians, the problem that they have now is that the policy that they pursued in the 1990s with great success has broken down for them. Uh, we put it as in the 1990s, Tehran was effectively able to have its cake and eat it too. It was able to have decent relations with Europe and with a number of other countries that gave it the trade, the economic benefits that it needed to at least keep the economy from collapsing and to deal with some of its other internal problems. But there was never enough animosity, there was never enough resistance from the Europeans, from the Japanese, from other countries to Tehran's pursuit of terrorism, to Tehran's pursuit of a nuclear program to actually force them to give it up. So they were both able to pursue their geostrategic aims and be able able to acquire what they needed in the realm of the economy, et cetera. And I think the greatest problem that Iran faces today is that seems to be coming to an end. Europe's greater motivation, its greater fear over Iran's nuclear program, uh, the fact that I have Foreign Secretary Straw on this panel right now suggests to me a much greater degree of European concern about the Iranian program, certainly than we saw in the 1990s. Uh, you can also make the case that the Bush administration has become more reasonable over the past year about Iran, and there's movement together, and as a result, the Iranian regime for the first time is seeing US and Europe moving to the same sheet of music. That's forcing them to rethink how they pursue this program. Ken, let me just press you on two things you raised, very quickly. One is you talk about the kaleidoscope, the differences within Iran. Do you see these in any way as threatening the stability, the basic fundamental continuity or stability of the regime? I think it unlikely, but I certainly do think that there are Iranians within the regime who do worry that some of these basic problems and the divisions that they are creating could have a more profound impact. I think that 1997 was a big shock for them. They're afraid of another shock like that. But your basic answer is, if, if you were a US policymaker, an English policymaker, or any policymaker, would you think that the basic stability of the regime is likely to be in question in the next couple of years? I think it unlikely that the regime is going to fall. Secondly, you're an anal analyst of Iran. Where is your sense of how far advanced they are with the nuclear program? What, is the, what, is the, what, what should be our working assumption here in terms of timetables? First, let me say that although I started out my career as a military analyst, I am not a physicist. I don't even play one on TV. Uh, but talking to the physicists, what I'm struck by is there does seem to be a very strong consensus that Iran is at least five and probably more like eight or ten years away from having a working nuclear weapon if that is, in fact, what they are determined to acquire. But they could obviously have enriched uranium many, many years sooner than that. Absolutely. Secretary of State. Thank you. Um, your question was, uh, what's going on and why? Well, what we know is going on is, obviously, that, they, that the Iranians have a nuclear power program, uh, and as part of that, they want to complete the fuel cycle. The other thing that's going, <laughs> going on is that the Iranian behavior has raised very high levels of suspicion and undermined confidence in their intentions. And for those who are not familiar uh, with the story, this is... Uh, and it's all on, it's not a matter of intelligence, it's a matter of record. 20 years of concealment of their fuel cycle program. Gradually, other things coming out, including research on polonium and plutonium. Fines by the IAEA boards of ins uh, Board of Inspectors, for example, of a manual from AQ Khan about how you create uh, depleted uranium hemispheres, uh, which have a purpose only in nuclear weapons and not in nuclear power plants, and the fact that this came from A.Q. Khan, a man with uh, 
unrivaled knowledge about how to make nuclear weapons and uh, no known expertise about how to make uh, uh, nuclear power. Um, and to their work on the Shahab 3 uh, missile system, which for sure can be uh, supplying uh, conventional warheads, but could be adapted uh, as a nuclear weapons delivery system. So that's what we know is going on. We also know that the Iranians have resolutely denied any uh, nuclear weapons intentions, and we have no certainty that they have those intentions. The working assumption in the international community from all sides is that it is prudent to assume, at the least, that Iran is seeking to develop the a nuclear weapons capability so that they can have the choice at some stage as to whether to activate it. Why are they doing that? Uh, they're doing it not least because of uh, what uh, Professor Ab Sari Agalam, I'll call him Mahmoud, is that easier? Uh, uh, what what Mahmoud uh, uh, said about 20th century humiliation of uh, the Iranians. And the more I know about Iran, Iran, the more I understand about the extent of this humiliation and the fact that Iran historically and today feels friendless. Uh, but Mahmoud uh, spelt that out. But you go back to the way in which um, after the constitutional revolution in 1906, uh, we, the Brits, um, ensured that we essentially uh, uh, helped ourselves to large amounts of Iranian oil without uh, uh, much going back uh, to Iran. Uh, the West effectively backed at the Shah. That, uh, if you want to understand why there is this intensity of feeling in favor of the celebration of people's uh, religious faith, understand too how the Shah uh, made it a criminal offense for a woman to wear a headscarf uh, and uh, had them uh, ripped off people in, in the streets. Then you've got the, the humiliation by Russia, Soviet Union, and by the United Kingdom. We jointly occupied uh, Iran between 1941 and 1946. Um, uh, you can say to the Iranians they should be grateful because uh, the result of this was that uh, we kept it out of the Soviet sphere, but I don't think they all see it quite in that way. Uh, if, if, when I first met Ahmadinejad, I think the first thing he said to me uh, was, uh, you guys with the CIA uh, overthrew uh, Mossadegh. Uh, I had to explain that I was uh, still at school, uh, 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 very young, but for him it was uh, like yesterday. Um, uh, the West uh, backed the Shah, uh, did not see the signs, uh, should have done. And then, of course, there's the thing that people don't mention elsewhere than in Iran, but, but is a fundamental to an understanding about Iran, the war. I'm not talking about the Second World War or the First World War. I'm talking about the uh, Iraq-Iranian War, where, again, the Iranians can rightly complain uh, that the West and everybody else did more to back the Iraqis than they did to back uh, the Iranians. So it's a sense of encirclement, humiliation. The irony of all this is that, and the paradox of it, uh, is that I Iran is now pursuing a policy, which is likely, to, if they get, make, make mistakes as they have done, to lead them to the same level of certainly isolation, if not humiliation. So there we are. How do we deal with them? I mean, well, just... Like, we, we, I want to hold off on the how we uh, deal with them. Okay. Uh, just a couple of things on what uh, Ken said. Uh, Ken, I don't believe the economy is uh, going to collapse I in Iran, um, point one. Not with, with oil. It is complicated. It's uh, not efficient, but it isn't going to collapse. It would be a grave error to think uh, that. Secondly, although, yes, it is a kaleidoscope, um, and the fact that my... Mo and and it, it is... Well, our analysts have put it that it's a, a pluralist theocracy uh, uh, with, with, with some move towards democracy. It's complicated. Actually, the decision-making on the nuclear file is not that complicated. There is a national consensus behind this. If you ask Iranians in the street whether they would like a nuclear weapon, many of them, particularly the mothers who lost sons in the war, will say, yes, if we'd had a nuclear weapon, uh, Iraq would not have attacked us. Um, so that at an emotional level, it's, it's, it's about power. And it's been pretty seamless. We put forward in the E3 proposals, which really would have enabled Iran to come out of the cold. They were rejected the day before Ahmadinejad took power, not the day after, August the 2nd, not August the 3rd. That said, Ahmadinejad's election has made a difference in terms of the atmospherics and the personalities in terms of our negotiations. And it was not easy going uh, when uh, Dr. Rouhani was leading the negotiations. Uh, it is more difficult uh, now that we have uh, Mr. Larijani leading them. Thank you, sir. Uh, Senator, I, 
obviously address any of the issues that come out, but also one other. Just imagine what I sense is the consensus here is basically right, that for various reasons, whether strategic reasons or domestic political reasons or psychological political reasons, Iran is likely to go far down this path, certainly to tee up a nuclear weapons option, if not actually develop one <clears throat> at this point. Uh, what do you also see as the stakes here? I mean, how significant is you is this, and does one, does one, when one thinks about this, use the word unacceptable? Well, I think uh, everybody in the world uses that term, Richard. Uh, I think this is a totally unacceptable situation. One thing that's kind of interesting to me, a year ago when I was here, the focus was on Iraq and what was happening there. And with the positive changes that have taken place in Iraq and the negative uh, changes, or I say perception of negative changes and rhetoric that is taking place in Iran, the paradigm has kind of shifted in this 12 months. And the, the panels that I have been on where the focus has been on foreign policy now, Iraq is barely mentioned, and we're talking about this issue. I think it's pretty significant from a worldwide standpoint when you think about the audience and the panels who are participating in this forum. So certainly I think the term uh, unacceptable is there. Last year, I was on a panel with the foreign minister of Iran, and I made the comment that the world cannot afford for Iran to be weaponized from a nuclear standpoint. I feel even stronger about that statement today. Um, and I think the world has recognized that, and, and the world does think that truly that type of situation cannot happen. Um, you know, uh, the focus in the Middle East right now being on Iran uh, the focus of the Middle East still, though, is from an oil production standpoint because petroleum still drives the economy of this world, particularly it drives the economy of the United States. It's imperative that we have as much stability in that part of the world as we possibly can have. And while what's happening in Iraq hopefully will promote some stability in the long term, we can't afford for the situation relative to this issue and Iran to develop into something that's going to create a truly unstable part of the world for the long term. Uh, obviously, that's one reason why it's of great concern to us. And then you have to ask the question, why would Iran want a nuclear weapon? Uh, the foreign minister last year said, well, if we did, it would be for defensive purposes. Well, defense from who? Uh, when you look at the neighborhood in which Iran uh, lives, there is no threat to Iran there. Uh, so from a defensive standpoint, I don't think that could be the case. Uh, so obviously the only other answer is that there would be some, some uh, uh, potentially offensive reason for it. We could not afford for a nuclear weapon to fall in the hands of a terrorist. And the potential is there for that to happen if they are successful in developing this weapon, even if it's down the road somewhere. Uh, I'll just close by saying that the perceptions coming out of Iran, particularly from a United States standpoint, and I'm not talking about the administration, I'm talking about more of the American populace, uh, the rhetoric that's coming out from the new president obviously has created a very negative perception, not just towards the United States, but towards some of our friends and allies around the world. So I think it's been a very positive move from the standpoint of worldwide reaction to those comments. Uh, I think we've got to continue to have that kind of reaction. The, the one thing that has surprised me a little bit is that there's not been a total uprising by the Arab neighbors of Iran to the comments and to this issue relative to uh, weaponization. Thank you, sir. What I, I'm not going to pretend that in 15 minutes we exhausted the analysis. There's time to return to it. But I wanted just to get on the table then the question of uh, what we do about what clearly seems to be, if the consensus here is right, in Iran that is likely to want to, again, either develop nuclear weapons or at least open, develop that option. Let me just sort of lay the table for a minute, if I might. In thinking about uh, the Iranian nuclear issue, uh, there's essentially, as I read what everyone is writing and listen to it, there, there seems to be four different approaches that have been put out there. Uh, the first is diplomacy. Secretary of State Straw alluded to it. The Europeans and others have been engaged in it. 
but some sort of a diplomatic engagement with the Iranians, which essentially gets them to meet international standards in the nuclear area, possibly other areas of behavior, in return for certain types of uh, inducements, economic, strategic, political inducements, some sort of a bargain or a deal. Uh, one, that's one option. The second option, clearly initially favored by this administration, is not to deal with this regime, but rather to overthrow it, to basically try to promote regime change in, in Iran based upon an analysis that it was uh, likely or at least possible. The third option are obviously the military options from so-called preventive strikes against selected facilities to something more broad, obviously raises a host of questions. And fourthly is the option of none of those, basically not diplomatic engagement or not, at least not successful diplomatic engagement, staying with this regime, laying off, mil avoiding military options, which gives you essentially some version of an Iran like the current one politically with some nuclear capability and either we decide we can live with it or we can't do anything about it or there's other ways of dealing with it through deterrence or what have you, some version, if you will, of the current situation with North Korea. And there seems to me to be some version of those four options that most people fall into, and I say that just to, uh, in some ways, describe the universe, at least as best as I can see it from the uh, strategic vantage point of Park Avenue, of, uh, of options for this uh, issue. Why don't we start, Secretary of State Story? You've been involved with this more than anyone at the panel, I think, in terms of the actual negotiations representing the government of one of the uh, European three. What, what is your sense of what makes what's, what's both desirable and feasible to do? Well, I, I, mean, I, I think the only, uh, well, you, you, you could do nothing, but I think I'll be uh, irresponsible uh, to try and just to leave it, um, given the <clears throat> huge confidence deficit there is in the Iranian uh, regime uh, and th the problems uh, that we've got. So uh, of the other three alternatives, uh, my own view is, however difficult, diplomacy uh, to, to, to secure a bargain uh, which does not involve humiliation of either side. And, and so I can't stress enough, it's true for all countries we think about it, but it's particularly true in respect of Iran, this sense of uh, national dignity, uh, the need to break out of its historic humiliation. We have to have a bargain which enables both sides to uh, come out of it with their head high, not, not low. Now, it's hard going, uh, let me say, um, and um, we've got further uh, detailed negotiations uh, next week. Um, and if Mahmoud won't mind me saying, it's, it's hard to think of a, uh, another uh, government, uh, which is harder to negotiate with uh, than Iranians. And some of my Iranian friends say that this is simply a national characteristic. And however much you change the regime, you still end up uh, uh, dealing with people who um, uh, uh, don't know when to uh, conclude a deal. But anyway, um, and, and you, you, you must comment on that. Uh, and you think you're, you're negotiating with uh, one set of rules, and then they announce that there's another. Anyway, but I, but I still have to think uh, that, that it is the only way through. One of the things that has happened in the last couple of years, Richard, despite all the frustrations, is that we have gradually gained a, a wider international consensus. Um, the E3, France, Germany, the UK, were slightly on their own, with others standing back saying, well, let's watch, watch these guys fall. Um, we then uh, were able to gain the, the, the tacit understanding of the United States, and increasingly to, to bring on board Russia and China. That doesn't mean there is agreement amongst all those parties, but there is a broader measure of understanding, and certainly of, of, of what the strategic objective is than there has been in the past. Let me just press you on one thing. That do you actually think that you could get, I guess, two things? One is this, the U.S. administration to join you in putting forward a package, not simply the current package, but one that would have a fully fleshed out set of uh, incentives for the Iranians. And at the same time, you could get the Russians and Chinese prepared to sign on to a list of sanctions or disincentives should the Iranians uh, not meet our requirements. Look, uh, this administration has been very forward, not, not to say courageous, in what it has allowed the E3 to do on behalf of the administration. Let's be clear about this. Last May, 
when we had some very difficult negotiations with Dr. Rouhani, uh, the American government said, and uh, they timed uh, the concessions directly with the outcome of our negotiations at the end of May, that if there was a satisfactory negotiation for that uh, round, then the Americans would lift their block on Iran beginning negotiations inside the WTO and uh, lift the block on the supply of aircraft spare parts, uh, which is far from a trivial issue for the Iranians because the fact they can't get good spare parts is one of the reasons, amongst others, why their planes are so unsafe. So, and that were those, I mean, those are really important moves by the United States government, uh, notwithstanding the very difficult politics in respect of Iran in the United States because of the uh, particular history and, frankly, the humiliation of the United States, which uh, the Iranian revolution uh, uh, created for them in 7980. So I do think uh, we, we, we would see step-by-step -step changes. Um, the senator is, is better able to comment on that, uh, but they have been very constructive. And on the other side, you've seen both an increasing anxiety, I believe, by Russia and China about the undesirability of uh, Iran as a nuclear weapon state, or even with that option of becoming a nuclear weapon, uh, a weapon state, and uh, a more active role being played, particularly by Russia, about the kind of solution uh, that uh, we, we might be able to alight on. Uh, I'm going to turn to the center in a second, but I wanted to ask uh, Professor uh, Sario, uh, Sario Gollum about uh, things really from the uh, point of view of Iran. Could you imagine that any package that could be offered would be enticing enough for Iran to ultimately satisfy international and IAEA requirements? Or coming back to your basic analysis, is essentially Iran prepared to pay a price with the world simply because it wants its nuclear option? Um, just like the Soviet Union and China, I think <clears throat> Iran's uh, political leadership is divided into two groups. Uh, the revolutionaries and the internationalists, what I call the internationalists. Dr. Rouhani and his uh, uh, team of negotiators were internationalists. And um, you perhaps would endorse that Dr. Rouhani intentionally kept out intelligence and military officers from the negotiation process. But with Ahmadinejad's presidency, uh, the negotiation process has been shifted from the internationalist group to the revolutionary group. Uh, there is no foreign policy um, uh, expert on the team. Uh, they're fundamentally uh, intelligence and military people who are negotiating. Uh, and they are much closer to the core of the elites in Iran. So perhaps this is another opportunity for the West uh, to come to grips with the essential needs of, of a revolutionary state. I tend to believe that Iran is still a revolutionary country. Um, the leadership, somewhere between 65 and 75, does maintain its um, revolutionary um, thinking and credentials. Having said that, I think, um, um, I think as long as, um, and I'm trying to base my uh, premise on cognitive studies, um, as long as the West, and particularly the United States, does not recognize uh, the sovereignty of this political system, um, I think we're going to see um, uh, a confrontation on the part of the Iranians with the West in general. Um, uh, I think also for purposes of domestic legitimation processes, this political system requires some degree of controlled confrontation with the West. Um, so that makes it extremely complex. On the one hand, uh, much of Iranian strategy is based on survival, and on the other hand, it wants to have a nuclear program that requires a very different foreign policy. So, so I think uh, as long as uh, there are no changes on the other side, and the Western assessment of the, um, of the nature of the system in Iran in the medium to long term, then we're not really going to see changes on either side. And Iranian policy is going to be one of ambiguity. Uh, Iranians, because of their literature and past, they adore ambiguity, and I think that's also reflected in Iranian foreign policy. Right. Let, me ask you, though, an, let me ask you an unambiguous 
question, though, which is uh, just imagine the United States did work more closely with the Europeans, even more closely than Secretary of State Strauss suggests, and they were willing to sit down with the, the Iranians. Could you imagine Ahmadinejad and his people being willing to have that type of uh, a relationship or conversation with the United States now? Um, I think from the Iranian side, uh, I'm just trying to read the mindset. Uh, I think from the Iranian side, uh, they uh, need an official, open, transparent recognition, the so-called uh, Iranian revolution and the current political system. But from the other side, I think it would require uh, to press Iran on the uh, Israeli issue. Uh, so there is a, there's a very complex linkage of issues and topics and history uh, between the two sides. Senator, I guess I've got two questions for you. One is, given what the president of Iran has said publicly about erasing Israel from the map, his other comments, could you imagine you and your colleagues supporting a package of incentives, even going so far as to say the United States accepts the Iranian revolution and all that, if they, for example, once again went back into the IAEA fold, do you, are people prepared to essentially support a, a package of incentives if we can get the Iranians to meet some of our basic requirements? I think it'd be extremely difficult. Uh, obviously, Israel is a very close ally of ours. Uh, there is a strong relationship between the United States Congress and um, uh, Israel. So I think as long as you have someone who is in a position of power, who um, uh, does not necessarily have close ties or virtually any ties with the United States, making comments like uh, President Ahmadinejad has, has made, then for us to be in a position to try to deliver any kind of package of incentives, I would think would be extremely difficult. Also before when I pressed you, you basically agreed with the idea that an Iranian nuclear weapon was, was unacceptable. If diplomacy doesn't work, if regime change doesn't happen, and it is truly unacceptable, maybe it's simply my paucity of imagination, but that does push you in the, the direction of thinking about military options. Given what the, the, the experience we've just had in Iraq, could you see uh, a domestic political consensus beginning to emerge in the United States that would favor, whether it's this, re this U.S. administration or its successor, potentially using a military force in, against Iran? Well, I think the only way you would ever see the United States engage in any kind of military action is if there were a large coalition of our European and Arab friends um, agreeing that that's the direction in which we ought to take. Um, I, you know, I, I guess I, I, I'm a little bit surprised, but I'm very pleased by the comments of, of Mahmoud relative to the feeling of the people of Iran and the fact that this leadership is a little bit uh, in the elite category versus uh, in the category of the way a majority of the people of Iran feel. Um, I've always felt like, whether it was when I visited Israelis or the Palestinians and you talk to the people and you, you realize that they want peace, whether their leaders are willing to move down the road or not, those people want peace. I've always felt like that when the people feel that way, that ultimately the right thing is going to happen. Uh, and if the people of Iran really do um, uh, want to have a peaceful Middle East, that, that, that uh, a nuclear weapon is not significantly important to them, um, then I think at the end of the day, the right thing is going to happen. Uh, again, I, I take some comfort in the comment that Iran is still in a revolutionary mode. Uh, the revolution could still work in, in the favor of a peaceful Iran or a more um, um, stable Iran, which obviously would get us over this crisis and hopefully move towards Iran becoming a leader in that part of the world in so many ways. And gee whiz, what a positive asset that could be for, for peace in the Middle East. Well, thank you. Uh, Ken Pollock, let me press you on the military issue. You've got, given your background, whether you think it's a, a feasible option to say do a, a, what would classically be known as a preventive strike, and second of all, whether you think it's a desirable option. And 
two factors in particular, it seems to me, come into play. One is the uh, likelihood that such an undertaking could succeed. And second of all, Iran's uh, choices, shall we say, are capacities for retaliation. They are not, shall we say, without instruments of influence themselves in the region. Well, what, is, what is your take on this? I think you've put your finger, Richard, on the, the, the two principal issues there. Uh, when you're thinking about military options, you always have to weigh costs versus benefits. And I think that uh, with a military option against Iran, the reason that it is suboptimal, and I will use exactly that term, uh, it's not impossible, it's not, uh, it would not be uh, completely off the table, but it would be suboptimal because right now the benefits are unclear and the costs are significant. In the benefits category, we don't know a great deal about the Iranian nuclear program. While there's certainly a lot of sites that we know about and could certainly obliterate those sites, we being the United States, which is the only country has, which has the military capacity to do so, we could certainly obliterate a great many sites in Iran. It would be a major military operation requiring a very significant commitment of U.S. air power assets. Again, all of which would be available. We would need to recognize it would be going to war with Iran. It would take probably on the order of several weeks to eliminate these targets. It would mean destroying Iran's air defenses as well. There probably would be a fair amount of, uh, of uh, collateral damage. And it's unclear at the end of the day exactly what we would have done to the Iranian nuclear program. It's just unclear at the end of the day how much we would have set it back. There are different physicists who you speak to who will tell you that given what the IAEA has found, they believe that even if the United States obliterated every single facility that we know about in Iran, it might only set back the Iranians two to four years, given how much they know about, given how far they are along. On the negative side, as you've pointed out, Richard, there are some very serious costs to be borne it would mean going to war with Iran, as I've just suggested. And I think it's fairly clear that the Iranians would not sit, uh, sit by idly uh, while the United States mounted a massive military operation against it. Uh, you've had some Iranian leaders say very explicitly that they would strike back, to take a phrase from the United States, at a time and place of their own choosing, and that time and place would likely be soonish in Iraq and Afghanistan, places where Iran is strong and where the United States has a great deal of difficulty. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Iraq, if you think it's bad now, uh, imagine 6,000 Iranian Revolutionary Guards and intelligence agents joining the insurgency. Uh, these are people who are far more skillful than mo most of the Iraqi insurgents. These are the people who helped Hezbollah give Israel 16 years of horrible headaches inside of Lebanon. So there are real costs to be borne. Uh, obviously, there's also the risk of terrorist attacks elsewhere. And beyond that, I think you also need to think about what it would do to Iran. Uh, we've talked about the, the fissures within the Iranian government. We've talked about the unhappiness of the Iranian people. I can think of few things that would drive the Iranian people more quickly and more firmly into the arms of the Ahmadinejad regime. I think that it would allow the hardliners in the regime to justify pretty much any measure they wanted to take in the name of mobilization against the external threat. And of course, Secretary Straw made reference to our bad history, both America's and Britain's bad history with Iran. It would play into all of these longstanding Iranian nightmares. Thank you. Let me just ask one last question, then I want to open up. Ken Pollock's argument was uh, that the use of military force would, in some ways, bring Iranians together, a, a rally round the flag uh, effect, so to speak. Would that also be true of sanctions? If the world put on political and economic sanctions against Iran, the regime would obviously try to use that as a, a rally. Would they succeed, or would that actually, in some ways, create greater tensions and fissures within the society? It would all depend on the nature of the sanctions. Um, <clears throat> uh, the argument in Iran is that we've had sanctions since 1981. So we've lived with these sanctions. So if they're going to be uh, expanded, they're going to be intensified, yes, uh, they will have an impact. But um, <clears throat> it will really depend on the nature of these sanctions. Yeah. Okay. Well, we turn it over to you. If people would make their uh, questions as brief as possible, wait for a microphone. We'll try to steer them, either you steer them or I'll steer them towards individuals up here. The shorter the questions, the shorter the answers, the more we can uh, pack in. David Greenway. Uh, Greenway of the Boston Globe. Um, given all the historical uh, reasons for Iran to be suspicious of the West. Um, 
at everything that the Foreign Minister Straw just said. I don't quite understand the necessity in Iran for the hostility against Israel. Uh, 30 years ago, you could take an El Al flight from Tel Aviv straight to Tehran. Um, it seemed in Iran's interest to have allies on the other side of the Arab world. What is the, what is the motivation for this hostility towards, uh, why is it necessary for the revolutionary regime? I think that's for you, Mahmoud. Um, I think <clears throat> this is history. Um, uh, those who are leading I Iran today, and uh, they're in their 60s and 70s, when they, when they were fighting the Shah's regime, uh, some uh, 40 years ago, um, they kind of put together Israel and the United States as supporters of the Shah's regime. So they developed the psychology of, um, of looking at the Shah's regime's uh, supporters as Israelis and the Americans put together. And then, then at the time, it was um, understood that Israel actually developed the Iranian intelligence and secret system. So uh, those who oppose the Shah, who are leading Iran today, uh, uh, they have this anti-Israeli, and I have to e emphasize, not anti-Jewish, but anti-Israeli um, um, psychology over the years. And that has become part of the revolutionary legacy in Iran. But, uh, but contrary to the Arab world, uh, the Iranian public, I think, is in contrast to the Iranian elites. Uh, there is no, uh, fundamentally speaking, there is no anti-Israeli sentiment in the Iranian society. Uh, I, as an instructor, I do speak about Israel openly with my students, and there are no hard feelings in the Iranian society in all classes and uh, strata. Uh, so I think uh, uh, this is uh, part of the revolutionary kind of uh, cognition that has developed over the years, and it has been indoctrinated through the revolutionary uh, militias and uh, military people. So I think, uh, I think as we move into the next generation of Iranian leaders, uh, perhaps in the next five to ten years, the question of Israel is not going to be as important. Thank you. There's a young lady over here. If people could turn off their cell phones, that would be great. Paisley Dodds with Associated Press. This question is for the senator. Senator, one could argue that we didn't have a, we as in the United States, didn't have a very strong coalition going into Iraq. I'm wondering what you would require in terms of a coalition if we went into Iran, and this is for Secretary why Straw. Just, why don't we just have one question? We've got too many people okay. queued up. I'm sorry. Well, obviously, it's difficult to say because we're not preparing for that right now, but um, I think when you see the worldwide reaction to the potential for weaponization by Iran, it's pretty easy to think in terms of a large coalition of folks uh, uh, being prepared to take whatever action is necessary. Uh, we start out on the diplomatic side, <clears throat> we exhaust every remedy there, and obviously we certainly hope that resolves the issue. But if it doesn't, then there still would have to be a large consensus, I think, before any military action could, uh, could be forthcoming. Ken's exactly right. This is not firing a couple of missiles into Iran and taking care of this problem. We're talking about a major issue. Uh, from a military standpoint, and we are not at the point today uh, that, that I'm, uh, I could feel the least bit comfortable thinking that America would be willing to do that without a large coalition of partners, hopefully inside the Arab world uh, as well as outside. Thank you, sir. Gareth Evans? We uh, get these microphones moving here. <laughs> To Jack Straw in the first instance, maybe one of the reasons it's been so difficult to get a diplomatic agreement is that there simply hasn't been enough on the table in terms of either an identified acceptable bottom line outcome and in terms of the incentives needed to get there. In terms of the bottom line outcome, the Europeans and everybody else has been insisting on abdication of the right to do the full fuel cycle, full fuel cycle, stopping short at least of industrial scale enrichment. Maybe you've just got to take a deep breath and albeit spreading it out in time, be prepared to accept that right to enrich 
and just rely on containment and inspections to stop you moving on there from weaponization. In terms of the incentives, you've mentioned the fact that on the carrot side, the Americans have been willing to come along partially with the WTO accession startup and the uh, beginnings of a release of some of the sanctions, but there's a hell of a lot more carrots that could potentially be offered, the full lifting of sanctions, diplomatic relations, full WTO accession, and of course negatives or other security assurances. Is it not possible, for all the difficulties of, that are of course involved in getting the Americans to come along with an incentive package, is it not possible to do more on the diplomatic front before we throw up our hands and accept another North Korea or another Iraq? Well, uh, Gareth, I, I absolutely certain it is possible to do more on the diplomatic front, um, and that's why uh, we and I have been continuing to do more on the diplomatic front, notwithstanding uh, the frustrations. And there's going to be a meeting between uh, Mr. Larijani's deputy and uh, our political directors on Monday as an indication of the fact we continue to uh, seek uh, a negotiated uh, way through this. And uh, Mohamed al Baradai, the Director General of the IAEA, uh, continues to, to talk to the Iranians as well. So, yes to that. Uh, the other thing, however, I'd say is, uh, and you forgive me for saying this, I, mean, I know you've got a slightly different view about what would be a satisfactory settlement, and, and the ICG plays a very important role. It, it is, however, as I know in different respects, as a spectator for one of the world's greatest uh, football, games, uh, football teams, uh, Blackburn Rovers, uh, always easier to score the goals if you're watching from the sidelines uh, that, 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 than it is on the pitch. Um, and, and indeed, and you'll remember uh, that you were once on the pitch and how difficult it was. Um, that was exactly my no, point. No, okay. Uh, and we, I mean, I, I'm looking forward to uh, your uh, paper that's coming out, if I can just give, give uh, an advertisement to, to it, I think, uh, next week. Look, we put forward proposals uh, back in, we, we drafted them in July, we submitted, submitted them in uh, early August. Um, and there have been criticism of them, they didn't go far enough, the language was a bit formal and so on. I mean, these were, this was, was a, an opening of negotiation. It wasn't the last word, it was, as it were, we were asked to do this, we did it, huge amount of effort went in, in, into this, including with our American friends, because whatever the Iranians say about America, I mean, much of their problem is about America, um, and much, many of the things they want for a normalization of relations are from America, not from anybody else. It's just a reality. Um, we don't have sanctions, or with uh, European countries don't have sanctions against Iran, except those which follow from sanctions from the United States, uh, where our companies are constrained because they have bigger markets uh, in America than they do in uh, Iran. Um, but on all sorts of areas, we, of course, were willing uh, to move and, uh, in terms of incentives as well. That required a negotiation. Instead of a negotiation, what we got was a peremptory rejection of what was on the table. Now, let me just also deal with this canard. Yes, the Iranians, under Article 4 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, have a right to develop civil nuclear power. No one is disputing that. But they also have an equal and opposite obligation under Article 2 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, not to do anything which leads them to having a nuclear weapons capability. And anybody with any understanding of the technology knows that it's the crossover is the nuclear fuel cycle. The problem is one of Iran's own makings, not of anybody else's. And what we have said is they have to provide objective guarantees that their nuclear capability is solely for civil nuclear power purposes. We are trying to help them. The Russians are trying to help them in the background, but with direct incentives, so is the United States. What we want to see them is them coming forward, and then we can get to a normalization, plenty of, of, of incentives, and all the rest. Thank you. Senator, you wanted to jump in here? Yeah, let me just carry that one step further, because um, in order for the United States to come forward with any kind of proposal, there's got to be some kind of level of trust. And when you look at the fact that the Iranians have been operating underground with their nuclear program for, gee, over a decade now, uh, behind the back of the IAEA, which I think is a very weak organization, frankly, um, it's going to take some overt action, obviously, to start developing some level of trust in order for us to come forward with anything that's significant. 
Ken, you wanted to jump in quickly? If I could. Um, Gareth, I, just, I wanted to, to agree with part of what you said, which is that in my own uh, analysis of the situation, I think it probably will require much greater, smart, much greater carrots and much greater sticks on the table to actually resolve this. Uh, I, I certainly hope that Secretary Straw is able to accomplish this without that. Um, if he and his mates are able to, I will be the first to offer my congratulations. But for exactly the reasons that Mahmoud specified earlier, the geostrategic considerations that are driving the Iranian program, I don't see what is currently on the table as being sufficient. And I think that ultimately it is going to require the imposition of much heavier, the, much, the use of much heavier sticks in terms of economic sanctions. And here again, I would just disagree with you, Secretary Straw, about the state of Iran's economy. I don't think that oil wealth equates to economic health, and I think it's one of the biggest problems in Iran right now. I think it is what the Iranians are most afraid of, is that there will be real economic sanctions imposed against them. By the same token, I do think that you're going to have to have the United States wielding very big, big carrots. I and mean, this is the, the irony of the current situation is, today we need Europe to wield the sticks and the United States to wield the carrots, and they need to be big ones to overcome the logjam in Tehran and the geostrategic incentives which are driving them forward. Uh, Tim Garton-Ash. Timothy Garton-Ash, Oxford. Um, can we talk a bit more about the people of Iran whom the senator rightly mentioned? Um, anyone who's traveled around Iran, as I have, talking to ordinary Iranians, um, finds that many Iranians, especially among the two-thirds of the population who are under 30 years of age are deeply unhappy with the regime and ambiguously, in a slightly confused way, pro-Western. It is my clear impression that sanctions imposed on the nuclear issue, let alone bombing, would drastically reduce that pro-Western feeling and produce a consolidation of support for the regime. One young Iranian woman said to me, I love George Bush but I would hate him if he bombed my country. My question to the panel is this. Is there not more that we could do as democracies to speak directly to Iranian public opinion, to encourage peaceful social pressure on the regime, both for democratic change and for moderation of their foreign policy? Say something, but I think of Mahmoud. Okay, can I quickly say sure. something? Uh, I won't. I won't. Uh, first, I think Tim, that's a, those are very important points. I'm not going to speak to the question of can the West speak directly to the Iranian people and energize them, perhaps against their regime. I think that that's a question better left to Mahmoud. What I will say, though, that I do think that the nuclear issue is ultimately about the Iranian people and putting in front of the Iranian people. A, a question to them as to what kind of a future they would like. Um, I don't think that a grand bargain is possible uh, because of the reasons that Mahmoud was talking about in terms of Ahmadinejad and his perspective on the West. What I do think is entirely possible is to lay out for the Iranian people two very different futures. A future in which they insist on retaining their nuclear program, continuing to move down this path toward getting the full fuel cycle, in which case they would suffer gradual process of greater and greater international sanctions against them. But sanctions which would be both graduated and which would, they would be incurring upon themselves by insisting on moving in this direction and defying the will of the international community. At the same token, I do think that part of this process has to be, and it's why I agree with Secretary Straw that, the, that President Bush's March 10 statement of last year was so important, because it is the first step in laying out for Iranians a very different vision of what their future might look like, one in which they give up this program, and I would also say give up their support for terrorism, which for Americans is a very important issue, which we've not talked about. In, and in so doing, integrating them into the global economy, lifting the U.S. sanctions, and let's remember, that's why the sanctions exist, was because of Iran's support for terrorism and pursuit of weapons of mass destruction. And going beyond that, to help Iran with their economic and political development and give them the prospect of a very nice, good, prosperous future. I think that if you can lay that out for the Iranians, that could very much change their incentive structure and change how they perceive this program and its value to Iran. Do you agree with that? Um, I think at the popular level, um, the Iranian society um, is extremely disorganized. Um, so perhaps that would be a good idea down the line if there is going to emerge a competitive political 
party system in Iran um, that will reflect um, various uh, uh, thinking of the Iranian society. But for the moment, I think the Iranian parliament could be a, a very useful avenue. Uh, there are elements within the current Iranian parliament uh, that think differently, that are very concerned about uh, Iranian image and prestige and Iranian international standing. When the president made those statements, there was a move in the Iranian parliament to impeach him uh, because of the consequences of those statements. So I think uh, for the time being, one uh, useful way of trying to influence public opinion in Iran and trying to get things done is through the Iranian parliament. Peter? My glasses, sir. Right, right there. Yes, sir. Thank you. I am Ernesto de Caise from El País, Spain. No, sorry, <clears throat> um, you all agree that uh, Iran represents not only a nuclear problem, and that is a political mat. And by the way, Hamas was elected in Palestine, and it's a very strong ally of Iran. My question to um, the Foreign Secretary is, in that situation, is the right course to go next week to the agency, the International Energy Agency, and vote a referral of the matter of Iran to the Security Council of United Nations? Well, uh, we've got to judge the right course in uh, what is a very fast-changing situation. Um, and it's fast-changing for Iran, and we need some movement uh, by Iran. We have the foreign ministers are meeting on Monday. Uh, and uh, we'll make a judgment then about the kind of resolution we put before the Board of Governors at the end of the week. Uh, but where we've got to uh, is that despite you know, very considerable efforts by the Europeans, uh, say with the backing of other uh, permanent members of the Security Council, um, Iran decided uh, before Christmas not to cooperate, but to break the seals on the uh, centrifuges and to move towards uh, fuel enrichment. Uh, and if that remains the position, uh, then I think the chances of them avoiding uh, a reference to the Security Council are low. Uh, and we would much prefer to resolve this within the IAEA. That's what it's there for. Uh, but the IAEA um, statutes also make clear uh, that where you can't resolve an issue and they're in non-compliance, and they are, then the matter goes to the Security Council. We're getting short on time. We've got time for a few more. I think I see Joe Jaffe all the way in the back. I wonder whether we shouldn't learn from, uh, from the uh, containment model that the United States applied against the Soviet Union, the idea being that we are dealing with a regime that has a revolutionary foreign policy. And revolutionary foreign policy, which seek to change the fundamental status quo, cannot be dealt with by reasonable this and that, tat for tat, big stick, small sticks. Uh, it has to be dealt with in the ways of George F. Kennan, who said, we will conduct a policy of containment that will lead either to the breakup or to the mellowing of Soviet power. So would anybody on the panel uh, care to, to, to talk about a co coalition of containment, an alliance against Iran, which will stabilize the neighborhood and, and play out a containment policy in the long run, which then ended up, unfortunately it took 40 years, with both the mellowing and the breakup of Soviet power. Let me just sort of follow up on that, maybe beginning with Ken, which is implicit in Joe's question, is that Iran is essentially deterrable, which the Soviet Union was. If you were advising a president, would you basically recommend a policy of, of containment, in a part of which, or a principal part of which, would be deterrence? Well, I think to a certain extent, the United States has been pursuing a policy of containment. I served in the Clinton administration and the NSC uh, working on Persian Gulf issues, and we were very explicitly following a policy of dual containment. Uh, even today, the United States is following a policy of containment. And I would suggest that in the future, if we're not able to solve this problem, yes, I think the containment will be one of the options on the table. Because of the problems inherent in the military option as, that I laid out, it may be that the United States decides that this is the best solution if we can't deal with it. That said, 
I think that it would be much better if we could take this issue off the table first and foremost. And I think that we have seen other countries where we didn't have to get into a similar Cold War kind of a situation because we were able to resolve the issue. Example? Libya. It took seven, eight years of sanctions, but it did, we did eventually convince the, the and yes, you're absolutely right, I, I see your little hand gesture. Libya is a much smaller country and much less important country and a much less difficult country than Iran. There's no question about it. It's simply the first one that came to mind. I'll bet I could think of other ones if I could. The point that, uh, the point that I'm making simply is that because the international community is united on this issue, and because Iran is not as powerful as the Soviet Union, it does open up other possibilities to solve this problem without getting into a long, drawn-out process of containment. I think that would be a much better way to solve the problem if we could do so. If we can't, then you're right. I think containment is one of the things that the United States is going to have to look very hard at. I think the Russian model is, is really not a fair comparison because it's such a more complex world and such a much more global world today than what it was during the Cold War. And we're not in a mode today of building up nuclear arsenals like there were back then to the point to where we decided we had reached a point that we need to come down, uh, which is what we're in now. And if you have a country that's uh, building up while we're in effect um, um, eliminating nuclear weapons, I think it puts you in a whole different atmosphere from the standpoint of containment. I don't think containment works. We may end up there, Joe, but I would just think there's going to be a lot of people uncomfortable with the idea of uh, policies of mutual assured destruction in this day and age with the regime with this personality, particularly with the regime with the history of supporting terrorism. One could hand off uh, uranium, enriched uranium, you know, basically the materials for a dirty bomb. So it may end up being the default option if all else has failed or all else is not tried, but no one is, it's not going to be people's first choice, that I'm confident. Mahmoud, you wanted to say something? I would argue that Iran is not a, um, an offensive revolutionary state, but a defensive revolutionary state. Um, perhaps no country, uh, as much as Iran, has uh, control over the Iraqi political, religious, security landscape. Um, that's also perhaps true in parts of Afghanistan. Uh, Iran is very influential in uh, uh, Lebanon and the Palestinian groups. These are all bargaining chips of a, of, a, of a defensive strategy that Iran is pursuing at the regional level uh, for survival. So I, I think more uh, than a, a Soviet uh, uh, policy, uh, I think a, an American-China policy would be at this, at this point in time. Uh, to, be, to be a realist would be much more um, uh, effective and relevant to, uh, in the American-Iranian relations. Uh, the Nixon doctrine of China, I think that's much more relevant. Uh, accepting the status quo, but, but pressuring the Iranian political system to accept certain principles of the, uh, at the regional level and also at the international level. Sir, you've been patient. You get the uh, last question here. The gentleman, I'm sorry, behind you. Yeah. Uh, Philip Baring, uh, International Herald Tribune, based in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm a bit surprised to hear that uh, the whole world is supposed to be uh, so critical of, of Iran. If you read a newspaper anywhere between Islamabad and Seoul, you might have a rather different opinion on this matter. Um, but uh, which brings me to the issue of uh, China and India, because rather than actually putting pressure on Iran at the moment. What we're seeing is the United States and the West generally putting pressure on China uh, at the UN, um, as though China was actually frightened of uh, the Iranian nuclear potential. Um, when actually what, what's happening is you're having to threaten China with uh, disadvantages elsewhere in order to go along with this coalition. Uh, ditto India, where India is being threatened with the loss of, of uh, nuclear cooperation you get and you other question? forms of cooperation. We've got to get to a question because we're running out of time here. Well, when are you going to, I mean, we hear at this whole conference that India and China are the keys to uh, the future of the world and of Asia in particular. Why are they not directly involved? Because they are the ones who are going to have the major impact in terms of the markets for Iranian gas. Secretary, so you want it, since you're involved most in the diplomacy. Um, look. China and India have a similar view to everybody else, which is that it would be a very bad idea if Iran became a nuclear weapon state. Uh, and the, if they were to become a nuclear weapon state, 
the knock-on effects of instability in the region and in the end in China and India's backyard would be very intense. Uh, so they are concerned. Of course, they have a different perspective uh, on this, and uh, I understand what you're saying about reading newspapers between <coughs> Islamabad and, and, and Seoul. Uh, and that, what you, your, your comments uh, illustrate the difficulty of maintaining an active international consensus here. And my last point, Richard, would be to, to say on this question that Joe raised and others raised, that my, my view, there, there are two fundamentals uh, to trying to resolve it, the Iran question in a satisfactory way. One is to understand the ambiguities and the subtleties of the situation. I mean, Mahmoud's presence here, the fact that he works in uh, Tehran, um, apparently uh, easily, is, is one illustration of some of the ambiguities of the Iranian situation. It, it, it is a complex society and a, a, a complex political situation and not an unstable political situation, but one uh, which is dynamic. And if we don't understand that, then we'll make some big mistakes. The second thing is, that if we're going to achieve anything uh, with Iran, it has to be done by the strongest possible international consensus. Not any doubt about that, insofar as we have actually got Iran voluntarily, we had, uh, to suspend conversion and enrichment, and we still, even though they've lifted the seals, haven't restarted enrichment. That's as a result of a strong international consensus, and it's what we're aiming to try and maintain. Thank you. Uh, there's nothing I've heard this morning that has shaken my, uh, my view that this is one of the more difficult and pressing challenges that we've got on the plate. Uh, given the nature of Iran and given the, the challenges of putting together an international response that is likely to have uh, effect for what it's worth, my own view is that it does make sense to tailor the most robust diplomatic option we can, if you will, expanding the carrots and the sticks. But I'm also unpersuaded that there's any guarantee it would work, given the nature of politics in Iran, given the impact of $65 a barrel oil, given the fact that the United States is tied down in Iraq, which reduces our uh, military leverage. And we then could face some extraordinary choices of either acting or not acting, uh, any of which would, be, uh, would have, uh, shall we say, major, major consequences for the region and for the world. My hunch is, as a result, that we will be returning to this issue at uh, future meetings in Davos. Let me thank uh, this panel of uh, four individuals for uh, being so smart and thoughtful this morning. And let me thank all of you for your interest and time. Good job. Good job.